Hey, sorry for the quick interruption, but it'd be incredible if you considered subscribing to the Solid Verbal YouTube channel right down below. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrandt, that fine gentleman over there. The one, the only, still the incomparable, now back yeah. in the heart of the Midwest, Chicago, Illinois, Dan Rubenstein, sir. Welcome back to the podcast. How goes it? My good it goes friend. well, and it maybe it took a trip to New York to to meet with you uh, to sort of plot out our off season and in season and start those discussions because it's never too early uh, to realize that we are we're sort of Big Ten coast to coast. I represent the <sighs> the westernmost Big Ten school, right? And in Eugene, Oregon. And I sort of represent the eastern flank, not fully because it's not Rutgers, the it's not the farthest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I'm close to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think both Rutgers and maybe Maryland ekes out, I think, State College in terms of how far east uh, the, the easternmost Big Ten schools are. And then I live in Chicago, which is the home base of the Big Ten. And so I want to take this opportunity to say uh, we're not just a Big Ten show. <laughs> <laughs> we're going national with today's concept as we go national every week. But it's weird to think about the fact that we are sort of encompassing a conference now that the University of Oregon, <laughs> as strange as it sounds, is a Big Ten school. A Big Ten power tie. A Big Ten power, yeah. And yeah. we're going to talk a little bit about that on today's episode. ESPN dropped a list of its top, per its experts, quote unquote, a list of its top 10 quarterbacks going into the 2024 season. Right. And I saw this. I have some thoughts on it. Yeah. And I brought it to you. I said, I, I feel like I need to get this out of my system. Let's talk a little bit more about it. So we're going to go through the list. We, of course, have a fun concept for it yeah. that we will unveil here shortly. There was also some news in the world of college football that I think we owe it to the Verballer Hood to at least go through. We don't have to spend too much time on it, but it is notable in our little corner of the universe that college football is considering putting radios and helmets and a two-minute warning and iPads on the side. We'll get into that here. Sure. In just a few minutes. If you're just joining us here, if you're new to the podcast, we broadcast two times per week all throughout the off season, at least on the public feed. There's an additional bonus episode, which you can go out and find at verballers.com or Patreon, V-E-R-B-A-L-L-E-R-S.com, if you are ever so inclined to check that out. In the meantime, hit subscribe, hit follow wherever it is you're listening to us now, watching us now. It would, of course, be appreciated. That helps us do what we do, help support the show, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have nothing to add there. I don't know if you want to talk about like helmet communications or two I, minute warnings. Or... I do. I do. Let's <laughs> do it. It's not breaking. I'm going to save my voice here if that's okay. Bleep, bleep. Yeah. But the, the big bit of news amid an off season that seemingly has an unlimited supply of breaking news, we've got a few proposed rule changes, the most, I think, practical of which is radios and quarterback helmets. Yeah. This has long been, long been one of those things where the NFL does one thing and college does another. There are a few of those still in play, but all it took was Connor Stallions. Yeah. All it took was Connor Stallions to scare the bejesus out of the NCAA. And suddenly we've got quarterback helmets that have radios in them. Um, the way this is going to work, very similar to the way it works in the NFL. There will be one player on offense only who's got the green dot on the back of his helmet. It will be the quarterback. Yeah. And coaches can radio in plays, radio in whatever comms to that player up until about 15 seconds left on the play clock, at which point, it will cut off. So for a good long time, this was a logistical thing. It was a logistical thing. There was a money issue at play. Obviously, it costs a little bit more to get those helmets out onto the field. But given the state of play, and I think I, I did a TikTok video on this, actually. Uh-oh. I did. I, listen, I'm cool. I think among all of the reasons why they should have done this for the last 30 years when the NFL was doing it, now the fact that we've got Connor Stallions in our world, Connor Stallion's news being investigated, the Michigan thing, I guess, to some extent, still sort of in a holding pattern. 
Uh, the fact that that burst onto the scene in the manner that it did, and now suddenly we've got these radios and helmets, that is not a coincidence, Dan. So right. long overdue, they should have done this a long time ago. Um, but the fact that I think we had an impetus, a reason to do it now has helped usher this era in. So, uh, join me in welcoming the green dot era to college football. Any thoughts on this? Any hot takes on? Yeah, well, no, I mean, the conversation certainly became a lot louder because of Michigan and allegations surrounding advanced scouting and sign stealing, whatever. And so the response was sort of that coaches lobbied against it because they enjoyed the gamesmanship of trying to decode and break the codes, whatever, of other teams and the signs that they had or hadn't changed before that big game, whatever. Um, look, you're you're adding responsibility to quarterbacks and or defensive players, you know, and there's a lot of tempo in the sport, perhaps more so than the NFL, depending on who you play. And so that's that's an added layer of challenge. Um and hopefully this isn't the end of code breaking or decoding because as serious as people take NFL football, as seriously as that sport, that level is taken, I don't believe personally that it's taken as seriously as winning college football games, which hopefully, fingers and toes crossed, leads to actual stolen AV signals <laughs> in radio comms and yeah. going to, you know, a shady country or two in search of technology and that we are going to have, you know, newspapers or media outlets finding foreign receipts of a booster who happened to go somewhere to pick up technology that is frowned upon Beautiful. on the open market in America in order to steal. I don't know. Michigan State's radio signal. Right. That's the next step. That, And I'm sure it's been attempted in the NFL, probably by the New England Patriots, if I know my NFL history like I, I think I do. But that's the next step that I welcome with open arms. Yeah, someone finds some proprietary zero-day technology yes, to course. exploit the system. Or to scramble, right? Or to scramble. To use... Right, what did they use on Whale Wars? The, the high-pitched <laughs> frequencies to... to that's right. what I want. I want it's it's not that they stole, it's that they pointed a very subtle something at the Boston College booth that right. scrambled the signal. Right? That you always see that in those like apocalyptic movies that there's right. some sort of electromagnetic pulse that's always used and it like EMP. downs helicopters. Always. That's the step that I'm most interested in as we head to radio comms, Ty. Do I understand this technology in the slightest? I do not. Why am I referencing this? Great question. I'm not sure. But that's the next step that I want to see the sort of hidden dark war involved in radio oh, yeah. communications and college football. And by the way, I'm, I'm not throwing shade at Connor Stallions. I'm actually, I'm actually kind of glad that... It's a worthwhile conversation. Why does college football not have radio work? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's been a long time coming. And if whatever he was purported to have done helped usher this in... yeah. I thank him. I salute him. This has been long overdue. We needed this. So that's one thing I think college football needed. One thing college football, I, we could debate as to whether or not college football actually needs is a two-minute warning. Right. A two-minute warning. Again, these rules are not formally in place. They, were vote, they will vote on them on April the 18th. We will find out if the helmets go into play. We will also find out about this two-minute warning. Quote, the two-minute timeout will allow all end of half and end of game timing rules to be simplified and sync up with this timeout, said Steve Shaw, secretary rules editor in the NCAA's announcement. Quote, this will also help broadcast partners to avoid back-to-back -back media timeouts. Dan, do you think this really means fewer commercials? No, you, I, don't get the, I don't get the sense that it does. I don't get the sense that the competition committee is acting independently of those who are issuing weekly or bi-weekly checks. And so as more money comes into the sport via television, adding a, a built-in timeout into the sport, unless it's like, hey, everybody, grab 25 seconds worth of water, <laughs> right? Right. Unless it's that across the board, which you didn't outline in the way that you described what was proposed. Um, I, I, I'm thinking there are going to be commercials, Ty. I'm thinking we're going to magically... 
even if it's just a commercial, even if it's like one of those soccer or NASCAR split screens, like we still see the field and we still see the coaches huddling up, but also there's a MasterCard commercial on the other side of the screen. <laughs> right. Somehow, right. some way, right. we're going to squeeze in an advertisement for Crest or Dr. Pepper or NCIS Sheboygan. Something is going to be squeezed in via this two minute warning. And who wins? Not you, not me. Not our buddies watching the games, but the good people at Yum Brands. Yeah, I, I just don't buy it. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there is some value to it. I'm sure the competition committee, uh, I'm sure you use the NFL as something of a go by to figure out whether or not Dumb. this was was doable. But I am not buying the whole. It's going to avoid back to back timeouts thing, because. Everything we have seen in college football over the last five years at this point, maybe yeah. longer, what, what has any of that done to promote fewer commercials? Remember going into this year with the clock rules, mm -hmm. the running clock, it's going to slow the game down or it's going to speed, speed the game up. up. Yeah, Excuse yeah, me. Yeah. It's going to speed the game up. Previously, it was slow. We're going to speed this thing up. And in reality, I don't know if it really meant that the games felt shorter. I think it felt shorter initially. I think Certainly, at first, yeah, it was a if, different rhythm. Yeah, if you were betting like first half lines, like I was at the start of the year, because the games are going to move quicker, and like I think it had a different feel initially. But in the end, it didn't. There weren't fewer commercials. There just weren't. Right. And so anytime we've got one of these announcements that comes out saying, "Hey, it might mean fewer commercials," I just don't. Buy it. That's BS to me. That's total BS. And I don't think they need a two minute warning. I. I, I, I do start getting the ick factor a little bit. I talked right. about it when we briefly mentioned the playoff expansion or the conversation about expanding to 14. That kind of creeped me out. Yeah. Anytime this game starts getting a little bit closer to the NFL version of football, that, mm, I don't know. Cause and remember, by cause, the way, even, even if it is true, right, that the two-minute warning helps to avoid back-to-back -back TV or media timeouts, whatever it's called, there's always going to be a certain amount of inventory of commercials That's that right. is sold or pre-programmed into a game. So if we're going to say it's going to avoid back to back here, which, you know, with, with the, you know, the old, the, the classic example is like, you know, CBS comes back from like a touchdown commercial break or something, a post touchdown commercial break, kickoff, touchback, <laughs> another. <laughs> Yeah, like that's yeah. it that's what we got that was the meaty segment we got like tennessee right. kicking the ball out of the end zone you got the blimp to shot right the blimp shot panning the stadium as they're exactly playing right. the cbs music right so what's going to happen is yes it might avoid that but also on the first one we get two or three more tacked on in there right two or da, three more commercials da, 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 right da, da, da. Yeah. so it's just they're going to find room they're going to squeeze it in somewhere and that's the experience of turning the sport over to, you know, CBS, NBC, uh, Fox and ESPN. I, when I posted this out there, I don't think anybody responded <laughs> happily yeah. to the two minute not. warning. Nobody did. Everybody saw it for what it was. By the way, on that note, ad free solid verbal episodes, verballers.com. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug. Yeah, yeah I have no the other that. the other proposals here, and again, these look like they're going to go into effect. Yeah, on April the eighteenth, teams can use eighteen tablets between the coaching booth, sideline, and locker room for the purpose of viewing in-game video only. Yeah, okay, that works. Goodbye, me. Warnings for uniforms violations, followed by a timeout being charged upon subsequent offenses God. from any member of that team violating teams that are. Out of timeouts would be assessed a five yard penalty. Okay. Cool. And also implementation of a 15 yard horse collar tackle penalty within the tackle box. Okay. All right. I guess that, if you're going to call the horse collar, call the horse collar. Right? Yeah. Fine by me. I, I mean, the only thing with horse collar is, you know, it can be bang, bang, and there can be intentional or unintentional. And, you know, referees by and large, I think, are doing their best. And so hope it works out. Hope it works out. Um, they still need to put the chip in the ball for me. Can we please just do that? I know it might only have limited practical application. Right. Just do it for me, please. For Ty. Okay. Just do it for me. See what we can come up with. Somebody, somebody can come up with a practical way 
to use that information, but yeah. put put the chip in the ball. I think look, when you when you talk about like the the very specifics of these competitive moments where whether it's, you know, the difference between a spot with a chip in the ball or not a chip in the ball, whether it's a horse collar tackle, you know, setting a team back 15 yards, these are not individual penalties that will decide a game. Games are decided over the course of dozens and dozens of plays. I think everybody's trying to do their best to make the game its most entertaining. And so yeah. hopefully these are non issues once the season begins. Dan, shall we move on to the club? Yeah, I don't know exactly what we're doing here, Ty. <laughs> but I, I know that as soon as you used the word club, I was like, all right, I can find oons, something oons, oons, oons. to help yeah. illustrate. So this is not, by the way. Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. This is not. I saw our friend Bill Connolly, who we actually ate with in New York. We did. We saw ago. Bill. It was great. He issued a like the 80 best quarterbacks since of like the 2000s, right? Right. And that generated a bunch of controversy with people yelling like, Matt Leiner, it's better than Marcus Mariota. Who's not as good as Baker Mayfield? Who's maybe better than Cam Newton? Definitely not as good as Vince Young. I like that. I like, I like that kind of argument. That is for me. But this is, we are, let's walk through this. So there's an ESPN list of the top 10 returning quarterbacks. Yes, it's one of those deals where they just label it as from ESPN.com. And then individual writers write individual breakdowns of specific guys. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So there there are a bunch of names on this. Nobody's hiding behind that ESPN.com. Schleybaugh but... wrote some of them. Yeah. You got Schleybaugh in there. You've got, um, you know, who else? Tom Van Heron. I mean, yep. just a whole host of names here that you're used to reading over. Adam Rittenberg, guys that... You're used to reading over on ESPN.com. And the article is titled Ranking the Top 10 College Football Quarterbacks in 2024. And so the reason you play the club music is I think we fashion ourselves as bouncers here mm -hmm. as part of this conversation, right? We're going to decide ultimately which of these names are we admitting into the solid verbal quarterback club and which are we stopping at the gate. Okay, fair enough. And Does maybe like a VIP room? A VIP room, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe we're monitoring for the VIP. Sure. Um, hopefully, you have some sort of cheesy velvet jacket that you can wear. Oh, well, that'd be nice. And well, look, how are you judged also by getting into a club? I say, as somebody who does not attend clubs and has not attended clubs and probably would not be admitted into those clubs, um, you're judged based on if you would, if you, if you look the part. Yep. If you've been there before and you're like, oh, yeah, this guy is an additive member of so-and-so club. Also, it helps depending on the company you keep. Interpret that however you'd like. But that's especially appropriate with quarterbacks that sometimes this quarterback isn't necessarily an obvious. Yes, you have to open up the ropes for him. But depending like you look at the receivers, you look at the offensive line, you look at the the position or the defense, the position that. His own defense will put him in, and I, I believe, we, you know, spoiler, I think Carson Beck is on top of this list. He is one of those quarterbacks who is certainly going to be advantaged by the defense on his own team and how advantaged playing quarterback for Georgia can be with what the Georgia defense has been these past few years. So I think all of those are reasonable. And so, yeah, maybe we have some quarterbacks coming of age. Maybe we have some quarterbacks dropping a few pounds and looking sleek and looking like they should be in this club, yeah. growing up, looking the part. So, yeah, we're going to be bouncers of the quarterback club, um, whether it's top 10 or whether or not we just we feel like they are uh, prime examples of who should be behind the velvet ropes. So the way that they conducted their polling and put this list together, it says, oomph, 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 oomph. thank you, Dan. Anytime I can. Continue. ESPN polled its college football reporters asking yeah. them to rank their top 10 quarterbacks entering the 24th season. Points were assigned based on their votes. So. 10 points for first place, nine points for second place, all the way down to one for 10th place, much the way we do our Verballer top 20 or top 12 poll, excuse me. Right. Out at Verballers.com, another shameless plug. You, you're right. Carson Beck was number one on this list, and I think he deserves to be on this list. We can go through the others. But the big thing that jumped out at me, honestly, this is kind of a crappy list. Is it? It's kind of a crappy list compared okay. to compared to the 23 season. Compared to the season we just had, the 10 names on this list, I came away feeling very underwhelmed by this list. 
There's no quarterback on here. No, no group of, let's say, four or five quarterbacks on here that I feel like I'd be afraid to play. Okay. I feel like it's really wide open in a way that remember going into the season last year, just the SEC season, we said, wow, this is going to be interesting because there are a lot of names on this list that don't necessarily put the fear of God into you. Right. I look at this list, this top 10 list, and certainly there are good names. Cam Ward is on this list. It's an interesting name. Cam Rising, another name that you can understand why he's on a list like this. But um, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, there aren't a whole lot of names on here that put that fear of God back into me. Okay. Um, well, here's the thing, too, with the list like this. Like, it's returning known quantities. It's very light on G5. I think there's a couple of G5 and also receiving votes. And guess what? There are a lot of quarterbacks playing in the American in the Sun Belt, whatever, who are going to be lighting up less than stellar defenses that will absolutely deserve to have their name on this list. Do you know who the number? You obviously don't. Um, not because of you, but because it's just a very specific stat. The third most efficient via quarterback rating, second most efficient quarterback via yards per attempt in November. So finishing the season strong was a G5 quarterback who I believe is returning, Preston Stone, SMU. Mm. Got hurt near the end of the year, obviously yeah. kind of affected things for the Mustangs. But like that somebody based on head coach, based on the offense, based on development of receivers that you're like, he could have a crazy productive 2024, nowhere to be found on this list. So this is a pretty fluid list right now. It's a fluid list, and it's also March. <laughs> it's March. But so you know what? I don't, I don't We're begrudge into spring anybody. Football, right? So you have, you have, okay, so Carson Beck, as an example, right? Loses his obvious best two dudes in Ladd McConkey and Brock Bowers. So this is kind of a new era for Georgia football's offense. Lose key players on the offensive line, but add in new intriguing guys, right? It's... Benjamin Urasek from Stanford, Colby Young from Miami. There's a receiver in there. I think John Humphreys from Vanderbilt, right? So it's just like, do you believe, maybe this is our question, Ty, do you believe in the March Carson Beck vibes as capital E elite or a capital V VIP? Is Carson Beck VIP? Yeah, he's definitely VIP, man. Okay. He's definitely VIP. I mean, I think just given the nature of the roster around him, it's hard to leave him behind the belt or <laughs> hard to keep him from uh, going into the VIP. Here. I agree. I agree. Here's the interesting thing about Carson Beck, though. I think he's really good. I know he's really good. Is, is there a defining characteristic of Carson Beck? Like if somebody asked you to define like what kind of quarterback is Carson Beck? You're just like, I don't know. He's really good. He's accurate. But like he's not huge physically. Good size. He's not a big runner. He's not bombing it down the field. Um, the system itself isn't crazy unique. So he just sort of exists as really good, which I guess is kind of the best way to exist. Well, I take issue with he's not huge physically. He's 6'4", 220. Yeah, speak for yourself. A lot of us are, Ty. <laughs> he's 6'4", 220. He's very accurate. He can no, he's got about... good size. Yeah, but I'm Com saying he's not... You know, he's not Joe Milton in terms of like a giant dude or Cam Newton, right? He's not, uh, right. he's not going to overwhelm you as b having unique size. He just has prototypical size. He yeah. has prototypical kind of pocket passer size. Definitely. Completed about 72, 73% of his passes last year, 22 touchdowns, six interceptions. So he's been pretty, pretty thrifty with the football. It does help to have that cast around him. Sure. Um, to your point, Brock Bowers, Lad McConkey. Lad McConkey, by the way, I don't know if you saw his combine. But what do you want a four 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 three? I mean, he looks legit. Yeah, at the combine for all the jokes that we made about Lad McConkey, this is your guy at Georgia. He's going to get picked and be a slot receiver Buddy, somewhere in the league. I watched him absolutely shred Oregon, and <laughs> at, from that moment on, I said, "Would love to have a Lad McConkey yeah, on the roster. No. Would love me, to have me that. a Culpa yeah. on that one." Carson yeah. Beck belongs in this club. Um, you don't necessarily need to have that defining characteristic. I That's think true. in order to be part of this club, no, especially, really good. especially in 2024, you know, he's going to still have an incredible cast of characters around him. He's only going to get better. What I think we both would like to see more of from Carson Beck is him being given the keys to the offense a little bit more because they ran it a lot last yep. season. They didn't need to rely on Carson Beck's arm. And there were moments last season when they did, and he was very, very good in that moment. So I think he's number one on this list. 
we're we're let can you play the music we're gonna let him through obviously he goes through thank you yeah of course no so carson uh, beck goes through here here's the thing about carson beck though and we, we talked about this heading into the season and it sort of seemed true of georgia during the season you look at the defenses played and you can go through them one by one auburn's was feisty had a good game against auburn good maybe not yeah he had a good game um mizzou good game Bama to get into the playoff, a play-in game for Georgia because of the 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 road that they were they were on that they needed to win that game. Uh, didn't have an incredible game against Alabama, so I think that's the like we have to see this right when they when there are limited opportunities to show out against a strong NFL-filled uh, defense. What do you do, Carson Beck? Good, pretty good, but didn't take over that game. And they were beat up along the offensive line. There are obviously issues. Uh, Mims left early on in that game, but his starting right tackle. But that's the only thing. It's just like, okay, the the brightest of lights. What does Carson Beck look like? Here are the other names on this top 10 list. Okay. And I want you as the bouncer to stop me if I rattle off a name that does not belong. Okay. VIPs. Number two, Dylan Gabriel, Oregon. Belongs. And I think a lot of that is the company that he's in line with to get into the club because Oregon looks to be pretty stacked on offense and the defense will do him. will put him in a lot of good positions, but yeah, given his experience, given his ceiling, which is pretty high, um, even though his own physical ceiling is pretty low that he is, you know, probably five ten. Um, yeah, he belongs in the VIP, I, especially compared against this class. Yes. I would, I would vote him number one, number one quarterback in the country heading into the put- year. I would absolutely put Dylan Gabriel number one. Is that because of what he's done as a yes. college quarterback? He's also older, right? He's older. I mean, physically, if you want to talk about maybe Carson Beck not yeah. having this prototypical Cam Newton, uh, Joe Milton physical side to him, yeah. um, Dylan Gabriel is is tiny by comparison, and he is an injury concern. But just given again the supporting cast and yeah. what he's done already, Dylan Gabriel will be number one for me. But they, well, you've talked about a pop gun arm with him in the past. I know. I know. He throws a good, but perhaps um, delayed deep ball, right? It hangs up there. He's accurate. He's my number one. He seems smart. And look, he's going to be throwing to who? Tez Johnson and Evan Stewart. He's behind a pretty experienced offensive line. Tight end is back. They're in good shape at running back. Like he is, he is in position. I think he has the opportunity from sort of the outset of the season. They have what Boise state early on. Uh, Oregon State early on, like he has an, enough decent opponents to like almost immediately establish himself as the best quarterback in the country. You're right. Num- number three is Quinn Ewers. Yeah. Number four is Jalen Milrow. Number five, we've got Noah Fafita. Number six, Jackson Dart. Seven, Jalen Daniels from Kansas. Yep. Eight, Shador Sanders, Colorado. Nine, Cam Rising, Utah. Ten, Cam Ward, Miami. So they also included here an others receiving vote category, which included Brady Cook, Riley Leonard, Will Howard, yeah. now of Ohio State, Will Howard, Garrett Green of West Virginia, Nico from Tennessee, Caden Salter from Liberty, DJU, Florida State, Jackson Arnold, Oklahoma, Connor Wegman, Texas A&M, my guy, our guy, Kyron Drones, Virginia Tech, and Will Rogers at Washington. So, of the remaining eight names, right after Dylan Gabriel, are there any names on this list that you see and they throw up a red flag, like they should not should not be given admittance into our quarterback club? I think it's a ceiling list. Um, Jalen Daniels has just been super hurt for like every. You know, he's, he's missing a ton of time. Was it back issues, back situations for Jalen Daniels? But at his best, he's absolutely worthy of being on this list. Um, I think the last two, I think it's a cam factor for me, Cam Rising and Cam Ward. I think Cam Ward is a ceiling player and at quarterback, I just want to see what your ninth best throw looks like. And, you know, his first four are great, but I don't know. Cam Ward at Miami, it doesn't strike me. I think... He tried to get an NFL grade that would uh, lead to him leaving, and 
he didn't. Um, and Cam Rising, I think, as a college football player, is intriguing at the top of the sport. Like you can understand like the best of Cam Rising being a Heisman candidate, but in terms of being a pure quarterback, with how little Utah finds, develops top tier receivers who can challenge guys down the field, like I think Cam Rising is good to really good, but like a VIP conversation. I don't know. I think he's a winner, but I'm not there with him. I'd rather take a chance on some of the also receiving votes or the other guys on this list as showing a little bit more in terms of just lethal quarterbacks. I'm not there with him. How do we feel about Quinn Ewers at three? Good, but not great. I, I think, think he's legitimately that's, very good. But that's my vibe on, on Quinn Ewers. Like, I think Quinn Ewers belongs on this list. Yeah. Quinn Ewers belongs in this top 10 but also bear in mind the context that brought us Quinn Ewers right Quinn Ewers started at Ohio State as one of the highest graded recruits ever sure he surely is very very good he throws a nice deep ball I love when he throws the rainmaker you know what yeah. I mean like the real the lollipop deep throw is one of the purest things that we've got in college football right now but right now we're talking about the NFL Combine and guys like Xavier Worthy who ran something like a sub four three, just right. incredible. I mean, he's had so much talent around him, and I feel like he still has left me wanting more. I, I keep waiting to see for a prolonged period of time the Quinn Ewers that I thought we were going to get when I saw the recruiting grade, and uh, I don't think right. we've seen that yet. That could still happen. I think it was a wise decision for him to come back to Texas. We know there have been some injury issues, but by and large, for me, Quinn Ewers belongs on this list. I'm just not as high on Quinn Ewers as I thought I was going to be after this season. So uh, three feels a little high to me. Jalen Milrow at four is an interesting selection. Um, I like Jalen Milrow. I like what Nick Saban and Tommy Reese did with Jalen Milrow. Yeah. I'm curious to see what Kalen DeBoer does with Jalen Milrow. Because the system that DeBoer runs is drastically different or has been drastically different from the system that we saw at Bama last season. If they're going to try and play like this more modern air raid game with Jalen Milrow, I don't think that's going to work. I suspect they won't because they know his skill set. But for me, that's something to watch. Four is high for Milrow. Probably belongs on this list. But four, top five for Jalen I'm not going. There. Well, it's also just kind of like a previously on the Jalen Milrow experience in watching the Rose Bowl where yeah, you wonder if there is, you know, if it's he's 100% a top 5 athlete in the sport and a top 5 playmaker in the sport, but if and I think the same thing applies not necessarily in terms of being an athlete, but for Quinn Ewers, but the thought of like if we're going to situationally grade it where you're like, okay, this guy has 93 seconds down four to drive the field and get a touchdown to win a game in a huge spot. But like, I don't fully hold like it against Quinn Ewers, what he looked like against Washington in the playoff, because I thought a lot of that was on Sark and the play calling, just like first down pass, first down pass, first down pass. Like, I don't think he was put in a great position. Uh, but in terms of like, am I terrified of either Quinn Ewers or Jalen Milrow with the game on the line, huge spotlight? you know, playing on the road in a, uh, the opening round of the playoff somewhere cold or something like that. I'm not there with either one of these guys in this moment, but you have to make the case for others, right? If you're not going to con consider them top five, right? who is that quarterback? You're like, I am terrified of him specifically in that scenario. And yeah. we just, you know, to compare anybody to Patrick Mahomes, but like I was rooting for the 49ers in the Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes got the ball in huge leverage spots and I knew what was going to happen. <laughs> You knew so, exactly what was going to happen. Completely right? unfair to compare any of these guys to Patrick Mahomes, but there is that emotion that you'd like to feel when you're rooting against this quarterback. Where you're like, yeah, I, this is done. And I kind of felt that with Michael Penix last year as an Oregon fan when he, and that was specific to like the receivers he had and his own talent and the coaching and the system, whatever. And I just, I don't necessarily get that. You mentioned fear of God. Like, I don't get that fear watching Quinn Ewers now with new receivers. New tight end, like running game should be very good. Offensive line should be very good. Like he is in an advantaged place. Jalen Moreau, even less so because of 
coaching overhaul, play, the roster overhaul at Alabama. Um, look, Kalen DeBoer will get the most out of his quarterback. And if that guy is, as we assume, it's going to be Jalen Milrow, Milrow will improve this year. But right now, heading into spring ball, new system, new players around him, I, I'm just not there because of what we saw against, granted, excellent Michigan team, the likes of which does not exist in the SEC this year in terms of that defense. Right. But um, it, it, that's more of an experience thing, too. I just, I'm not there. He's in the club. He's absolutely in the club. And I don't know if I can pick somebody to bring in the VIP room instead of him, but I'm keeping a watchful eye, Ty. There are three guys that I'm kicking out of the club. Okay. I'm kicking off this list. I'm kicking Jalen Daniels from Kansas off the list. Exciting player, but he's got to stay on the field. New offensive coordinator this year. New coordinator. I, look, I'm rooting for Kansas. I like Jalen Daniels. I yeah. wanted to see more of him, and that would be the only reason why I leave him off this list. He's at seven right now, and Bill Connolly wrote the little blurb on him. Um, Isn't I, that I get, like the best ability is availability? Yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's I think where I'm at with Jalen Daniels. I'd kick Cam Rising off this list too. Okay, I would. I like Cam Rising. I like all these guys. I'm not rooting against any of these guys, but he didn't play last year. No, he didn't play. And there is something to be said for what version are we going to get a Cam Rising? I think he could certainly play at a top ten level. I understand why he's on this list, but I want to I want to see what he looks like when he returns to form at Utah. The other thing that I think works to Utah's favor is that they're going into a new conference. Well, Ty, you set me up very nicely there. Quick little alley-oop for, for Dan Rubenstein in the third person. You ready? Yeah. These are the defenses Cam Rising is going to face I got this it in year. front of me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Southern Utah, Baylor, Utah State, Oklahoma State. We'll see. Okay. Arizona. Dwayne, Dwayne Aquinas, the defensive coordinator? He's going to be an analyst for Texas. Never been a defensive coordinator. As like a, by the way, Dwayne Aquina tangent here has been the offensive coordinator and now will be the defensive coordinator for the university of arizona I think okay that's kind of cool um asu's defense frisky improved lost key players tcu houston byu colorado iowa state should have very good defense ucf disappointing defense um somewhat so uh cam rising it might just be a matter of he might, it might be the right year to be Cam Rising and looking to be the most handsome boy at a club <laughs> because it's set up pretty nicely depending on what his own offense looks like this year, which it's another year Utah probably won't have an NFL receiver. Um, it's a good situation defensively. All right. I, he stays in the club. Okay. He stays in the club. I'm looking at this as I am speaking in okay. real time. And I reserve the right to change my mind. Cam okay. Rising can stay because okay. Good. Utah could win the Big 12 like that. Certainly. They could win the Big 12 with Cam Rising just being serviceable with Utah playing its brand of football, the, the brand of football that they play all the time under Kyle, Kyle Whittingham against a schedule like that. Yeah. All right. Cam Rising can stay. Cam Ward's gone, though. Okay. Cam, Cam Ward's gone. And again, exciting player. If he, I think, lives up to some of the hype cam ward will end up on this list and cam ward will end up probably as a first round pick in the nfl again if he lives up to that hype but you think he's going to end up as a first round you think there's a world in which cam ward is a first round quarterback 100 percent. Ooh, 100 percent. that's a that's a strong he almost came out this me. year he almost came out this year and he didn't why ty because he's probably because the nfl is like, no this is not you're not a high round pick if he lives up to the hype yeah and that is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Then I could see it. But he's got a ways to go. And when you want to become a first round NFL quarterback, when you previously didn't appear to be Mario, you got to go to a Mario Cristobal. You go to Mario Cristobal. Justin Herbert, first round quarterback, appeared to be that before Mario Cristobal. But all right, let me ask yeah. you this. Would you rather have Cam Ward? Would you rather have Jalen Daniels on this list in our club? Or would you rather have Will Howard? From Ohio State. Oh, probably Will Howard. Would you rather have Brady Cook? Definitely Brady Cook. Would you Luther rather... Burden's back. Yeah. Would They'll run the hell out of the ball as well. Yeah. Riley Leonard. Okay. So Riley Leonard at Notre Dame with what? An exodus of receivers working in a new system, new offensive coordinator. 
with big time success recently, Mike Dembrock. I think I'd rather have, if you're looking at both Riley Leonard and Cam Ward as kind of athletes with upside, like Cam Ward doesn't run the ball a ton. I think Riley Leonard runs the ball more. I don't have their numbers in front of me, but Cam Ward is the, is the improviser, I think, between those two. Uh, I think, right, ugh, God, Cam Ward's going to have a good offensive line, man. He's going to have a good offensive line. And look, I think Notre Dame's offensive line will probably improve, though they lose their best offensive lineman, right? Joe Alt. Joe Alt, yeah. He's going to be a first-round pick. I'm, I'm not putting Riley Leonard on this top 10, but I'm putting Brady Cook in there, and I'm putting Will Howard in there. The fact that Will Howard was left off of this. What do I call Will Howard? Walker Howard? Walker Howard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I would put Will Howard because, again, I think he's advantaged. I don't know if he's necessarily the most handsome boy in line, but the company he keeps, I think, will make him attractive to I'd those put, controlling the velvet ropes. I'd put Will Howard at three on this list. Will Howard at three? Yeah. Okay. Look at the talent around him, man. Look at the quarterback. Uh, look at the, the system that Chip Kelly's going to bring and how advantageous that's, that's going to be true. for a quarterback of, of his ilk. Right? It would be different if it were a Bill O'Brien system. It would be different if it were the Ryan Day system. To some extent, it still will be the Ryan Day system. But yeah. we know that Chip Kelly knows how to get creative with quarterbacks that can move. That's sort of been his thing. And Will Howard's big boy. He's got a lot around him. Ohio State has certainly not taken its foot off the gas. There is an open question about the offensive line. I know that. Yeah. But I, I don't see how he could fail in that system. So I'd put him up at three. And I'd probably put Shador at number four above Quinn Ewers, above who else have they got here? Jalen Milrow. I, I don't know. Even Noah Fafita, I might put above those guys. So Noah Fafita is interesting because might have the best receiver in the country to throw to. Offensive line certainly got better last year. Could be involved in a lot of shootouts because I'm not sure I trust the 2024 version of their defense, which I guess in terms of bottom line numbers, Noah Fafita could, up, could put up cartoonish numbers this year uh by the way you know who arizona hired at offensive coordinator about three weeks ago dino babers Dino. so that's right. it should be a wide open pass happy offense once again although syracuse's offense took a lot of different forms uh depending on the uh the roster but i think they're going to be in good shape offensively i would have fafita maybe a little bit higher i think we're now underrating quinn ewers a little bit they, they brought in a bunch of receivers in the portal. They've recruited really well at receiver. They have another five-star, I think, five-star coming in this year at Texas. Depend, I think it's Ryan Wingo. I don't have the class of 2024 memorized. Um, and was it Jonte Cook last year? So there's a lot in the pipeline at Texas. And then you bring in Silas Bolden from Oregon State. Like He's going to have a lot to work with, um, and especially behind that offensive line. I would have him ahead of Fafita. Just in terms of like what's what's available to him and the continuity of having Sark. Who's ahead of Fafita? I would have Quinn Ewers ahead of Fafita. All right, we're back to Quinn Ewers here. Yeah. I'm just saying what Texas has available, the company that Quinn Ewers keeps to me, is still pretty attractive. All right, so here's what I'm doing on the fly. Okay. I've got Gabriel 1, Carson Beck 2. Yeah. Are we okay with that? Yeah. I've got Will Howard three. Now you're going to say that's too high, but this is my list. I put Will Howard three. Because I think Kansas, of, because I think of the State, situation he finds himself in. Yeah. Well, I think Kansas State fans are quick to point out that when the going is good for Will Howard in terms of what's around him, he performs. He's just not somebody who can raise the level all of the time. And now that he has Chip Kelly, all due respect to Colin Klein, Chip Kelly's a better offensive mind than Colin Klein. He has those running backs, depending on what the offensive line looks like. He has a stacked receiving room, and now added to with Jeremiah Smith, number one overall recruit. Like, I think Will Howard has every opportunity to... Will Howard could be the best quarterback in America this year. I agree. That's why he's three for me. So, yeah, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see more consistency. So I think I would have Quinn Ewers still ahead of him. I mean, there's like a Ewers line that I'm sort of drawing in the sand right now. Um, so I would have him like five, five or six. Yeah. All right. So you've got, who's, who's your three then? If I've got Will Howard, who is your third best? So my third best after 
I, I agree with the top two in Beck and Gabriel. Um, my third best, let me pull up the list just to make sure I have everybody. Um, it might be Jackson Dart. I kind of deliberated with putting Dart at number three. I was going to move him up to number five above Quinn Ewers. He's going to have a lot available to him. Yeah, Adding my Juice list, Wells. My list is Gabriel Beck, Howard three. I've got Shador at four. I've That's got an Jack- offensive line question to me with Shador. Is he going to have time to do to show off? I've got Jackson Dart at five and then Quinn Ewers at six. Dart's a good case, though. There's a, there's a big case to be made that Jackson Dart, I think he matured last season. Yeah. And, you know, his numbers were, were very, very sound. 23 touchdowns, five picks. Got some rushing yards in there. Actually had like eight rushing touchdowns. We know he can move on the ground through for close to 3,400 yards. Given what they've got coming back, you know, Trey Harris, George Watkins, like they lose Quinshawn Judkins, that hurts, but there's still plenty of ammo. I don't care about running backs in that way. And they yeah. added who? Logan Diggs? Logan guy. Diggs, yeah. Um, I think they'll be fine. It's kind of an offensive line question to me, and it's kind of like what is the rhythm of an Ole Miss game with we'll see how much the defense improves. Because right now, if you're Ole Miss, obviously Bama's going to be more gettable, it seems. But you lose by 35 to Georgia last year. The rhythm of what does the defense do in terms of getting off the field against the best teams? I was impressed with Jackson Dart for the most part against Penn State. Look, they won 11 games with the bowl. They go 10-2. and two. And they add to it and look, adding in, you know, Walter Nolan, Chris Paul, guys, Prince Lee, I don't remember how to pronounce his last name, Uman Melian uh, from Florida on the Edge. Like, I think Jackson Dart is keeping really good company in this line and I would absolutely have him in the VIP section. So yes, he is probably my number three or four. You've got him at three. Who's your four then? So if I if I'm moving Jackson Dart up to four, I'd probably go Ewers and then Howard, but I think there's like a VIP within the VIP. Um, so after Howard, then are you going Fafita? Yes, I would put Fafita ahead of Milrow. Milrow, and then maybe Brady Cook. Yeah, I would put. I might put. I would probably put Brady Cook again ahead of Milrow as well. I'm putting together a, a common list here. So yeah. we've got Gabriel Beck. There's some debate over Will Howard, but we, I think, both acknowledge he's in the top five. Yeah. I've got Shador at four and Jackson Dart at five. You've got Dart at three, Ewers at four, Howard at five. So kind of in that order. Mm-hmm. Um, other names that we could add to this list. I mean, Milrow, you mentioned. Jalen Milrow probably belongs. On Will Rogers list as is well. interesting because of Jed Fish's. Uh, recent history with developing quarterbacks. Okay. But Washington is a total gut rebuild. Okay. Um, so for me, my full list goes like this. Okay. It goes Gabriel 1, Carson Beck 2, Will Howard 3, Shador Sanders 4. I go Jackson Dart 5 by a nose ahead of Quinn Ewers. Okay. At 6. I've got Noah Fafita at seven, Brady Cook at eight, Jalen Milrow at nine, and then Cam Rising at 10. I might put Jalen Daniels ahead of Cam Rising. Okay. Just because ceiling-wise, I think Jalen Daniels is more interesting. What do you do with quarterbacks who we know will be starting but haven't had a lot of experience where like you are gambling on upside? Like Nico at Tennessee. You're like, I don't know, Tennessee quarterback. Not on the list. I know he's not on the list, but like, would you rather go into the season with Cam Rising or Nico as your quarterback? I would probably go Cam Rising. Okay. I you probably would get. too, but I'd have you know to sit and think get. about it. You know what you're going to get. I know, but that, is that a good thing? Is that always a good thing? Would you rather go into the season with Nico or with DJU? Nico. I've, I've just I've seen the DJU experience. I know the good. I know the bad. I think he's has a ceiling of like a a solid B quarterback. Nico or Kyron and Jones, and he was advantaged last year with Jonathan Smith. Nico and or he'll Kyron be Jones, FSU. What? Nico or Kyron Jones? Uh, I'd probably go Nico. 
because of the system. Yeah. Interesting. The physical upside. And, you know, I'm a sucker for, and this is like our, our, our Bruce Feldman. Like, I love when I hear that somebody's great at another sport. Oh. <laughs> like, I love that Nico was like a top tier volleyball player. I sure. love all that stuff. So, all right, your list then, you've got Gabriel and Beck one and two. We're yeah. in agreement there. You've got Jackson Dart, Quinn Ewers, three, four. Yeah. You've got Will Howard, five. Then after that, as I've been jotting these down, you've got Noah Fafita ahead of Jalen Milrow, ahead of Brady Cook at eight. It sounds like maybe you've got Jalen Daniels uh, ahead of Cam Rising. Mm-hmm. Puts him at 10. Are you putting Shadur Sanders in here at all? I think at his best, if he had a replacement level offensive line, yeah, he'd be in there. He'd be in that like 8, 9, 10 area for me. Can I yes. give you another name that I am... I'm not shocked is not in this conversation, but in terms of a name that could like swoop in like the fan man at a boxing match. Sure. Forget who was, was that a Holyfield fight? Um, <laughs> look that up while I, I go on and on. Um, sometimes you look at coaches who consistently produce top five, top three, top seven, top 10 Heisman winners, first round quarterbacks. And you're like, all right, who's that guy's quarterback this year? And you're talking about just top 10 in the country. To say, like, maybe a Lincoln Riley quarterback won't be in that conversation kind of is antithetical to where we've been as a sport. Like, if and when, I don't know if it's Jade Maiava or if it's Miller Moss or whatever, that seems like an open competition, but like, Miller Moss is going to have every opportunity if it's him with his experience and age and still having some interesting offensive talent, offensive linemen, whatever. Why would you not include Miller Moss or whoever the, the Lincoln Riley quarterback is? In this conversation, when he exclusively produces Heisman winners, well, in you could put him in picks. You could put him in other others receiving votes, but okay, there's yeah, just not a fine. huge body of work here. No, I, I'm more saying like guys that again, a fan man who could swoop in later on in the season into this conversation. I don't think it's right to put Miller Moss as like the number eight quarterback in the country, but in terms of track record, just penciling in like a, a Tecmo Super Bowl player who did not agree to have his name in the game, like QB Eagles, just like. QB Lincoln Riley in this list, like to be named later, like by week seven. Yeah, I'd be good with that. Yeah. I mean, as we round things out here, Dan, some other names that I think are of interest. Yep. Please. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about Garrett Green, but Garrett Green, I think also falls into that category for West Virginia Yeah, of having an advantageous conference situation. Mm hmm. Now, their schedule is not quite what you described for Utah. I think it's harder. But Garrett Green came on down the stretch last season. And I think despite the fact that he started the year and there was some concern over whether or not he would be the guy, I think he grew into that role admirably. So Garrett Green, I think, is a good one that I would keep an eye on. And, you know, I, <laughs> I don't want to jinx him, but... Yeah. We can have a Tyler Shuck conversation. We can have a Tyler Shuck conversation. There's a lot of conversations to be had. We can have a Connor Wegman conversation. Yeah. Yeah. We can have a Brock Vandegrift conversation. We can have a, like, I, I enjoy a lot of the conversations that could be had within the sport. TVD Wisconsin. Don't say mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Um. Drew Aller with a better offensive coordinator. I don't Drew know what, Aller. like, oh. star power at receiver looks like for Drew Aller. I'm going to need to see more. Yeah. But like the best of Drew Aller is 100% a top 10 national quarterback. I think, I think the fringe for me is probably Riley Leonard. R Riley Leonard for me would be like 11 or 12 on this list. Okay. And, um, receiver room is an open question the same way it was a year ago. But they're going to run him. He's going to run. That, that's why they hired Den Brock. He, he is going to run. He is going to show off his athleticism. Yeah. The open question on Riley Leonard is, I think, how accurate he is as a passer, what his processing is like when he drops back to pass. But there's really no question about whether or not the kid's an athlete. Right. You know, he can run. And I think they're going to lean on that pretty heavily this year. So the numbers will be there. The wins will be there. Notre Dame will definitely be in the conversation. I'm probably not ready to put him in my top 10 here, but I think he's right on the cusp. Real quick, if you like the video, please consider subscribing to the full podcast at solidverbal.com, Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. All the links are down below in the description.
Can I give you another fan man name? One more name. By the way, it was Holyfield Bow. Holyfield Bow. Thank you. Yeah. I knew Holyfield was involved. Um, what about Alex Orgy? Oh, man. Another fan man conversation. Love where it's just like, orgy. who's flying in from the rafters who shouldn't be in this conversation right now? But given, look, this is an incredibly successful program. That you know Sean Moore is going to want to run the hell out of the ball. That there's going to be play action opportunities. That maybe receiver is developed a little bit better or counted on a little bit more. It's not going to be a great year for Michigan's offense, probably, given what they lose up front. But still, I don't know, man. He had some experience on the field. Dual threat. Could pick up yards on the ground, yards through the air. If he's that guy, obviously there's going to be competition. But... That's another fan man name that I would throw in. Swoop in. Let us know. Solidverbal at gmail.com. Let us know who we left out, who we were too high on, who we were too low on. Yeah. Please reach out. Verballers.com. Daquan Finn. Baylor. Put all your money right now. Put it in. Who, who do you put in your top 10 club? Let us know. Um, we will be back on Thursday. We will talk, of course, more college yes. football. Hit subscribe. Hit follow wherever it is. You are listening and watching. Your support throughout the offseason is much encouraged. Uh, let us know. Reach out again. Let us know what you think of our quarterback club. Let us know what you think of this list. It's interesting going into the spring, right? It's an interesting conversation because of what? The transfers in Will Howard and Dylan Gabriel near the top of this list. And like I mentioned to Quan Finn to end it up, but like he's jumping up essentially a level in the sport going from the MAC to the Big 12. And you got new systems, new coordinators. Like it's a really fun spring like i don't think you were down on this year's quarterback class i think you're down on the known quantities of this year's quarterback class maybe you're just down it maybe i'm putting words in your mouth but i think that makes this spring and this fall that much more fun right in again solidverbal at gmail.com hit us up on social media for that guy over there my good friend dan rubenstein for the millions upon millions listening at home as per usual stay solid peace